Hello and welcome to part four of the series on the UK rotary face converter. I really hope this is going to be the last part that I don't have to go on to to a fifth part. It's taken me far longer than I possibly imagined to get all these details down. But I hope you're bearing with me and let's get into it. Here's the final complete diagram for your rotary converter showing all of the parts that have been mentioned in part three, apart from one, the earth leakage circuit breaker, also known as a residual current circuit breaker. I can't recommend strongly enough that you have one of these. They measure the outgoing current and compare it with what returns. If there's less returning, that means some of it's going to earth, which probably means you're getting an electric shock and they'll cut a lot. Um, this has saved me on one of my machines when I had some damp insulation. Can't recommend strongly enough you get one. The motor rated miniature circuit breaker in your consumer unit. Double pole isolator, the amp meter showing the total current consumed by the converter. Here's the starter push switch which operates the contactor to energize the starting motor and also pull in the no volt release which then holds in once it's been switched on. This just quickly zigs around to there. The converter control switch which is a double pole a double throw center off switch. You can use a generator changeover switch for this purpose. And the rotary converter itself with the neutral going straight onto the star point. This is the thing which is connected via the bus bar on your converter. So the three terminals in the previous vid on the right hand side of the motor are the ends of the motor windings. The three which are connected to make the converter run as star are the neutral point or the star point of the converter. This is the bit which gives you the true neutral and not the nasty floating neutral that other converters do. Finally this contactor on the converter itself you might be wondering why a contactor is needed to switch out to these capacitors and the reason is that if they were permanently coupled when you start the converter when this switch is thrown between start and run there is a momentary position in the middle where the converter will be off and then its own momentum will be spinning. What will happen if the capacitors are still connected is that the converter will rapidly lose speed because it's charging these capacitors back up. When you then switch it into run it will have lost sufficient speed that upon recovering when the power goes back on you get a fairly nasty and large current surge. So I've overcome this by wiring the contactor coil. This is a bit of a bodge, but it does work. I've bought a 415 volt coiled contactor that runs off one of the false phases. It's important that it comes off one of the false phases and not the true live here, which goes back to the star point. That's really only truly getting 240 but what it means is is that when you start the converter by applying voltage across two phases there is insufficient voltage to pull this coil down what happens is it'll hum and buzz but not pull down and not make that contact when the full voltage is applied by putting 240 across one coil and to the star point there's then sufficient voltage for this contactor to pull in and switch the capacitors into circuit. As to the capacitors themselves, you're really going to have to do some trial and error. I found when I built this converter that none of the phases were equal in strength. Obviously the true live phase was the strongest, but these two were not equal between themselves. One was stronger than the other. I would guess the reason for this so as this converter is spinning, this phase here is ahead of the strong phase, but this phase here is lagging behind it. That is my layman's guess as to why one phase is stronger than the other. I initially started by putting capacitor between these two, 
and some fairly strange things happened with the voltages that were not what I expected at all. What I found to be most successful, and this was trial and error, is to put one capacitor from the strongest phase to the weakest phase, and then another smaller capacitor between that phase and the next weakest phase. You may find that you have to do differently, but what is important is that you check your currents and voltages of each phase at every stage. General rule, putting increased capacitance will increase the voltage of the phase and therefore the current. But in this converter where you have two false phases, that's not always what's happening and it's a line of best fit. Down here is the supply to the machines. The only thing I'd say about that is that in wiring my machines, each of them will have a no volt release starter, direct online starter. And in wiring my machines, I've always ensured that the strongest phase, L1, which is the true live back here, forms one side of the coil upon which the contactors operate. Also, I've used that strongest phase there to run the lighting transformers from. And the two false phases are just dealing with the other two phases on the three phase motor and all, all the, the additional loads of the contactors and lighting transformers are all on L1. The things I've not shown on here are the additional instrumentation. You can see I've got the amp meter in there which is showing the total power, the total current consumed. There's no voltmeters. Um, essentially on my system I've got those three uh, nice red pygmy lamps. They're 240 volt lamps and it follows that each of them is wired from A phase back to neutral, which gives you 240 volts. The voltmeter I've wired to show the voltage of the one strong phase, which shows me the voltage of supply. And as I said in part three, it's really up to you. You could have as many voltmeters and amp meters as you want. I'm sure you're quite capable of uh, working out better ways of doing it than what I've done here. You're gonna end up having to make quite a few electrical connections on this job. Please don't use one of those horrible, nasty crimping tools. Get yourself a proper ratcheting crimping tool. Borrow one off an electrical friend. These can be bought relatively cheaply now. They do the far, job far better and more importantly, safer. Another bit of kit, which is pretty much essential for the balancing job of the balancing the converter is a clamp meter. This allows you to measure currents simply by clipping the, the, the meter around the cable without having to introduce a meter into the circuit. Introducing ammeters into three-phase circuits is particularly difficult because of the high starting current. Most multimeters will handle a current of around 10 amps, which is fine for the running current of the motor, but the starting current is far in excess of that. How you distribute the three-phase power around your workshop is probably outside the remit of this video, but I'm using these quite nice galvanized metal boxes. Inside the metal galvanized boxes, I'm using these motor terminal blocks, which provide a really neat and convenient means of terminating the three live phases down this side, my neutral and my earth. These are type KM terminal blocks available in a range of sizes. These are M5 studs, but they're available in different sizes. And they're from a UK company called Highwire. When you start to balance or tune your converter with the capacitors, it's important to remember that unless you do something really, really clever with variable capacitors in a complex control system, if using fixed value capacitors as I am, the capacitors can only ever tune the converter for one load condition. So you're going to be aiming for a line of best fit, a best average. If you tune the converter to run quite happily on its own without any machines running, then you'll find the voltages will drop as soon as you switch the machine on. The way that I've got my converter set up is that when the converter solely is running, I find that the voltages on each phase are a little bit high, 
but why would I want to run the converter with nothing running off it? I've tuned my converter to run happily with my most commonly used machine, which is my lathe. And I've tuned it so that the voltages are about right when the lathe is running. It just so happens, thinking back of my little list of all the machines I run, that the lathe is four horsepower, the milling machine is three, as is my shaper. So that makes up the majority of the machine sizes. As you can hear, not only the converter's running, but I've got the lathe switched on as well, my most commonly used machine. And my clamp meter here is measuring volts and not current. So let's have a quick look. got two volts between earth and neutral. I happen to live in an area where there's historically been an issue with high voltage on the neutral so this isn't a good example but importantly it's only two volts not 240 volts as you would get with many of the converters that are out there. So L1 is my true live phase this is the single phase supply we'll see what we're getting on there. Ah, uh, wobbly hands. 239 volts. My electrical supply at home varies between about 232 and 252 depending on what day it is and what time of day. Sunday dinner, everyone's got their electric cookers on, the voltage goes down. Live to 246 volts. Live 3, 244. What we should be getting is approximately 240 volts on each phase, but I'm calling a 5 volt differential actually fairly good for a homemade converter. Let's check the voltages between each phase. So we're looking at 415 volts between each phase. 416 419 432 You'll struggle to beat that with even the best rotary converters available as proprietary items Let's look at the currents we're getting now if you do put a spindle ammeter on your machine, I've got one on my most frequently used machine, it's important to make sure that it is actually on the strongest phase. And the strongest phase may not necessarily be the one which is true live after you've added the capacitors. So it's important to check. But in starting this, you can see why you really can't use your normal kind of multimeter to determine current. because it would make it go bang. This is where the clamp meter really comes into its own. So these phases here are coloured as they are on the supply box you've seen earlier. This brown one here is L1. So the lathe motor is running but the lathe isn't doing any work. 1.68 amps. 2.26 amps on L2 and L3 2.18 Let's see what happens when we spin it up so This phase here is actually strengthened now Even though it's the true live you'd expect that to go down wouldn't you? This one's got a little bit less. That one's gone up a bit. So there's no real exact science. I've got the voltages pretty damn good, but to expect to perfectly balance both the voltages and the currents is fairly unrealistic. And even if you 
locked on a factory system which might be powering several different machines, some of which might only be using one or two phases. You never ever expect all of the phases to be perfectly in balance. For a DIY converter, this really is as good as you're gonna get, and I think it's quite good. If any of your machines do have digital equipment on, like my mill, whilst you can take voltage from A phase to neutral to give you 240, because that's what most of these run off, I'm not risking that. I've got my digital readout plumbed directly into the single phase supply and I'm not taking the voltage off the converter. That just seems uh, a risk too far. Just a quick recap of how I achieved the belt tension and starting with the belt slip on this converter. I think that's about all I can say on the matter at the moment. The real difficult bit is balancing the system with the capacitors. I'm running a 50 something microfarad, I think 46 microfarad on one phase and 22 between the others, but those are good figures to work with, somewhere between 25 and 50 as a starting point. And thereafter, it's experimentation. I really hope you find this series of videos useful. I wish you well with your own rotary converter installations. Good luck.